Well, welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast. Uh, John Stone Street here, president of the Colson Center. Glad to have you joining us today. And uh, what an incredible honor uh, to once again uh, on the Breakpoint Podcast talk to the Honorable Sam Brownback, uh, former ambassador at large for international religious freedom in the United States and a convener of a very, very important gathering. And I'm just looking here, ambassador of the incredible amount of organizations that I'm so glad, uh, Colson Center included, that have come on board to support this International Religious Freedom uh, Summit. It's uh, IRF Summit 2021. You can find out more about it at irfsummit.com. Uh, and uh, you have been at the helm of so many of the most important efforts on international religious liberty on the political end of things for so long. So Ambassador Brownback, great to have you back on the Breakpoint Podcast. Hey, John, great to be back with you. And uh, you guys have such a great legacy. Uh, Chuck Colson was a mentor of mine. He's a mentor of a lot of us, uh, probably you too. Absolutely. And uh, just did so many things. And one of the key things he was interested in, he was interested in life, marriage, and religious freedom. Uh, and those have been kind of hallmarks of work that I've been a part of as well. And I, I thought he just set such a great model and example, and you guys continue to carry that. So delighted to join the program. Well, you know, people ask who would fill his shoes, and we all said it's impossible. But uh, by God's grace, we can stand on his shoulders. And it was in 2009 uh, that uh, Chuck Colson, uh, along with Timothy George, dean, then dean of Beeson Divinity School, and of course, Professor Robert George, probably the foremost Catholic intellectual of our time, authored a document on life, marriage, and religious liberty called the Manhattan Declaration. And uh, I was among the early signers, 500,000 Americans signed on to it, stating, you know, this is where we have to stand as Christians on this place of religious liberty. And, um, you know, I've got to admit, Ambassador, at the time, uh, and I, I may have been the youngest guy in the room when it was announced about, you know, 25 of us in, in New York, uh, it's where the name Manhattan is at the Manhattan Club. And, and I, I remember thinking life, of course, marriage, yeah, I mean, the same sex issue, you know, and the, the state battles over religious liberty, you know, were heating up. But Religious liberty. I mean, I guess I kind of assumed it was as American as football and uh, an apple pie. And I tell you, he turned out to be quite prescient to include religious liberty in that list, didn't he? He really did. And the attacks uh, really from the, the left on this, but also just really from a lot of different people that uh, want this sort of... Um, they, they, they don't want a voice speaking into the society and culture that has a traditional moral viewpoint. They, they just don't, they don't, want to, they don't want to hear it. Mm. They don't want to allow space for it to be spoken. And back when this thing was first signed, that, uh, you know, people wouldn't have thought any, they, they wouldn't have thought you're going to try to exclude the space from even being occupied by somebody to speak. That everybody has an opportunity to speak. As long as you're peaceful, you can speak. Well, now you've got this cancel culture. You've got this movement about we don't even want those voices right. in this society. And so really, we've got to stand up. And, and this one is just such a foundational human right. It was foundational, the creation of the country. And I'm traveling all over the world. I just got back from Sudan a couple of days ago. The, the protection of religious freedom, particularly for religious minorities, is essential to be able to build a country. Because otherwise, your minorities are always being persecuted and pushed on. And the root of most genocides recent times in the world have been of religious minorities being persecuted. The most recent being the Uyghur Muslims in China. It's a religious minority. They get persecuted. Uh, and this is just so critically foundational. But increasingly, we're going to have to really fight for it in our own country here. I think that's such an important observation that so many of the... Um acts of brutal uh, group on group violence that have fit the category of genocide. That's a very, many people don't realize how specific a definition that is. You just can't call anything genocide. Genocide has an officially uh, recognized definition, but most of those have been uh, the result of the degradation of religious freedom or the lack of acknowledgement. On the flip side, and, and, and so much of your work has been international uh, in your work as the ambassador at large for international religious freedom, uh, for example, you've also seen, and, and you you said it quickly, but I'd love for you to, to maybe unlock a little bit more. Religious freedom is the first freedom in the U.S. Constitution. 
it, it's seen as a bedrock. It's not one among many. It is a larger category that incorporates so many other things. And you've seen how it's a linchpin. I mean, you you lose religious liberty and so many of the other freedoms fall apart as well. Is that your experience internationally? It is. Like I mentioned, I just got back from the Sudan. The prior government there was a radical Islamist military government. And under them, they had two genocides. Uh, now, one of them was of a, you know, more of an ethnic group, but the other one was primarily of the Christians that are, that are dominantly located in the South. You, I talked about the Uyghurs. You've got the Rohingya in Burma that were run out, and they're primarily really run out because they're Muslims, and the rest of Burma is primarily Buddhist. Uh, and of course, the, you know, the granddaddy, is, uh, the Jewish Holocaust in World War II was of a religious minority that took place. And you, you just can't protect your minority's rights if you don't protect their religious freedom rights, if you don't allow them to be the people that they want to be peacefully practicing their faith. This is, is foundation to an economy. You're seeing now the United Arab Emirates really expand uh, and open up their society because they're seeing if we just demand everybody must be a Sunni Muslim that comes through here, we can't grow a country or an economy. Mm. And we're going to have a lot more conflict. So that's why it's so foundational. And it's so foundational here, John. That's, the, the to me, the sad point. Uh, the United States is the country that stood for this around the world. And we've stood for it for a long period of time. And as it, if it does erode here, it will erode even further globally. Well, I, I, uh, we have said that on a number of occasions on our commentaries that when Christians in America struggle or hesitate to defend religious freedom, because maybe it feels like selfishness, it feels like covering our own backsides, but nobody else, you know, th that's an important reminder. How many nations around the world have an ambassador at large for international religious freedom? that have any, not only the habit or if they, anything like it, that has any teeth that can actually make any difference, that can actually make any impact. And, and of course, the answer is if we lose religious liberty here in the United States, it's, it, we're not, we're going to lose one of religious liberty's great defenders internationally. And it's at a particularly critical time. One of the things we remind our folks of each year, Ambassador, is the Open Doors World Watch List, which measures religious yes. persecution, particularly of Christians. But, you know, each year is the worst year on record for the persecution of Christians. Would you say that that's this, in other words, the worst year on record is 2020, and before that was 2019. In other words, we're going in the wrong direction. Do you see that same thing across religious identities, that each year uh, religious minorities are more, I mean, we know about the Uyghur minority, that's, that's a relatively new thing in the last three, three to five years. Is it, is it getting worse across the religious spectrum? That's what the Pew Trust uh, polling information tells us, that uh, most of the world uh, population lives in a country of significant religious persecution. Mm -hmm. I, but, you know, John, unfortunately, it, it actually gets worse than that. Uh, the Chinese government now is standing up and saying they have an ideology that should legitimately compete with the United States democracy, Western, Western democracy, capitalism on the world stage. And they're saying theirs is an equally viable system that people can adopt. Now, this is an authoritarian, mercantilist uh, type of system that they put forward. And they're saying it's equal to uh, democracy and free market capitalism. Uh, in their system, you, the, the authoritarian rules and controls uh, the religious access of the people. They are at war with faith, uh, and they are at war with every faith, because in communism, communists have just to have a struggle with religion because communists are atheists, and they don't believe in a higher uh, authority. They don't believe in God, and they don't believe in the allegiance to God, and they don't like people that have an allegiance to God. Well, now you've got this competing globalized system that goes right at the heart of religious freedom. It says, no, the state controls this space. And we say, no, God controls this space because it's a human right. It's a dignity of the individual. Uh, so we've got a tough situation around the world. 
And now we have a global competitor that's putting up an ideology that's directly opposite to what we're putting forward. Well, I want to come back to China here in a little bit, but you know, you're tackling all of these issues. The main focus is international religious freedom at the IRF Summit 2021. Again, you go to irfsummit.com to find out more about it. Uh, you know, Ambassador, you were known for uh, in your work as the uh, the ambassador at large for international religious uh, liberty for holding a government you know event for the last two uh, uh, summers. Um, and I'm blanking out on the name of it. Forgive me. A minute, ministerial, 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 and religious liberty. And the gathering was absolutely unbelievable in scope and scale. Um, and I, I wish that would be continued on in the current administration uh, yeah. to some degree. It, it doesn't look like that's the case. Um, is is this an attempt, the IRF summit, to kind of carry on some of the initial work in that gathering? Is the goals a little bit different? Tell us what you're after here. And I want to encourage people to look it up, sign up, and. And, 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 and come and attend it in the newly reopened Washington, D.C. area. That's really that is what we're doing, uh, John, is we did those ministerials uh, where we invited governments from all over the world and civil society activists to come together around the topic of religious freedom. And we were saying this is a bedrock foundational human right. You get this one right, you're going to get a lot of the others right. You get this one wrong, you're going to get a bunch of the others wrong. And we had over 100 governments participated. It was the largest human rights event ever held at State Department, the second one. We had to shut registration off three weeks in advance because we were just full. Uh, and so what this is, is an effort to migrate it to the outside, to the civil society groups, but to continue it. And then it's not dependent upon who's elected president, uh, who's in the White House. It's the civil society groups. And we've got over 70 of them sponsoring this, stating, our mantra is religious freedom for everybody, everywhere, all the time. We've got all the major religions of the world joining together. And, and frankly, if we could just get the major religions of the world to come together and stand for each other's religious freedom, game over. We win. The, the governments would not be able to manipulate, because right now they'll use a majority religion against a minority religion, or the Chinese will just kind of threaten everybody. But in most places, there's kind of a nationalist uh, religion that has the premier spot, and then they subjugate all the other minority faiths. Well, if everybody said, no, that's not the system. This is a human right. This is a foundational issue, and we're going to stand for the minority faiths in our own country. Uh, we really blow this thing wide open, and I think we, we can move a long ways forward for religious freedom for everybody. You know, there's a phrase um, that uh, Chuck Colson embraced. I think I think it's a Francis Schaeffer phrase, co-belligerence. Uh, you know, we don't agree on everything, but what we do agree on, we can be co-belligerence on. Uh, Timothy George, the uh, co-author of the Manhattan Declaration on Life, Marriage, and Religious Liberty, used the phrase, the ecumenism of the trenches. Um, and, you know, these are ways to talk about working together in no means. I mean, our name's on here along with those 70 others. And I'm just here on the website. I mean, good heavens, what a lineup of organizations coming together saying, look, right now we've got to stand for religious freedom. We've got to stand for each other. And there are groups that we wouldn't work with on almost any other issue. There are groups that we wouldn't think has the truth, that we, you know, would, uh, you know, be very, very nervous. But then, there are our friends at China Aid, Bob Fu. Of course, you were just with yeah. us in, in uh, Fort Worth. Uh, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, the Religious Freedom Institute, Tom Farr and our friends over there. Um, you know, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, uh, the uh, In Defense of Christians Organization, the Religious Freedom Coalition, uh, the Institute for Religion and Democracy. Mark was just on our podcast a couple weeks ago, the Heritage Foundation. I mean, this list, the Anglican Church in North America, that, that's my uh, a, a partner denomination. Um, and talk about religious freedom issues. My church is out of Nigeria. That's a terrible, terrible place for religious persecution right now. The, yeah. These are groups partnering together across faith lines because we can all agree on the centrality of religious freedom. Now, I think religious freedom only makes sense in light of the understanding that we're all made in the image and likeness of God. Um, so I find the grounding for religious freedom in a distinctly Christian worldview, but I believe that the Christian worldview is true. And that's why everyone can recognize 
this idea, as you put it, I want you to repeat it too. Religious freedom every time, everywhere. Our mantra is religious freedom for everybody, everywhere, all the time. And it, it is grounded in the, the Christian belief, but you know, I look at it, I see this freedom as God's freedom to us. He gave us the right to do with our own soul whatever we choose. And he knew ahead of time that if we did do that, he would have to send his son to clean up the mess. And he still did it. He still did it, knowing how much it was going to cost him. So there must be something extraordinarily precious about this particular liberty given to mankind, and one such that we should not allow any government to interfere with it, and we should allow everybody to freely exercise it. The other thing I would point out is at this gathering, we will not be talking about theology because we do not agree on theology. This is not about a common theology. It's about a common human right and one that well, I believe was given to us by God uh, and that the American founders in particular saw the preciousness of it and the need for it and, and went so far as to protect it at the first order, the first thing is this one to protect this right. The other thing I want to point out too, and I think this is you know, incredibly important, is, is that this gathering is not political. This is not a bunch of Republicans talking about this or a bunch of Democrats talking about this. And, and in, in an era where, good, good heavens, is there anything that's not political? Is there anything that's not partisan? partisan? Maybe it's this. Maybe this is the thing that we can hold up and go, look, we can all agree on this. Now, I think in our nation, the, the, the divide on religious liberty sometimes is far too partisan on you know, val- you know the, the clash of values. But I want you to talk a little bit about what's going to happen at the event. Who, who, are, who's, who's, who, are, who are the speakers? Who's been invited? What, what's, the, what's the bipartisan approach here that you're taking? Well, we've got uh, Katrina Lantos Sweat, whose husband and father were both former Democrat members of Congress, and myself are the two co-chairs of it. We've got House and Senate Republican and Democrat co-chairs of it. We've worked hard to maintain the bipartisan nature of this, which has been historically true of this topic of international religious freedom. While domestically we have a lot of disagreements about religious freedom, when we look internationally, we've been, we've been able to maintain that bipartisan nature of it. And what will happen at the event, the primary issue that we're after is relationship building between the people that come. As I believe fully that if we have people start to come together in respectful, loving relationships at this event, working together, and they may be of completely different religions, and hopefully actually they are, if they start coming together and standing up and fighting for each other's religious freedom, this can radically change the world. This can go grassroots in the religions around the world uh, and will have great power. If we're just about projecting a message, if we're about getting some press and, and drawing attention to this, we'll have some value, but it won't, it won't be the global changing event that this needs to be. Now, you're going to hear from a lot of different speakers. We're going to have people that have been persecuted for their faith from various uh, places. We're going to have religious leaders, political leaders, business leaders all coming forward that have had some connection to the persecution or have worked for people that have been persecuted. And then we're going to have a youth track on it as well to bring that next generation. We'll have 100 young people at it that we hope to get inspired to move forward in this unfortunately growing field of, uh, of interest. So it's, it's really coming together nicely. Uh, we max out at a thousand uh, people that can come for the hotel. We're at about, you know, 750 uh, right now. So we've got some slots. People can still sign up, uh, but I wouldn't doubt that we'll, we'll fill it all up. Uh, I think so. And again, the dates are July the 13th through the 15th. So we're a couple weeks out here. It's in Washington, D.C. You can go to irfsummit.com irfsummit.com. I, I really appreciate, uh, Ambassador, not only the bipartisan uh, scope of uh, we're trying to bring people together to move this needle forward, uh, but also the, 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 the various aspects of culture, education, nonprofit, the political space, uh, the NGOs, the business community, because really that's how this stuff needs to advance. We, we, need to, we, we need to stop being territorial over our own particular 
um, arenas of, of culture and uh, uh, work together for, for some of these that are really important. And in, in light of that, I want to come back to the China question just really quickly, um, you know, because we know that not only has China been an incredibly bad actor, uh, as, I think, as you put it, every, to everyone, I mean, who, who are they not targeting right now? Um, but we have a lot of corporate interests in the United States that are not uh, acknowledging that. Um, you know, it's almost like China says, uh, you know, jump and they say, how high? I mean, you know, there was that famous story just a few weeks ago of supposed former wrestler, tough guy, John Cena, you know, who apologized all over himself for daring to call Taiwan a nation. You know, and it had to do because his movie was about to be released in China. And, and you look at Disney and you look at, the various things. What what what's your assessment of the corporate uh, 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 willingness to speak out against some of these bad actors? Um, I think it's weak, but I think it's getting better. I think one of the things that President Trump did was started to teach the world how to criticize China, hmm. because the the world had we we'd all given them a pass for. 15 years at least, 20 years, all of us thinking, well, as they grew economically and they would integrate more with the global economy, they would loosen up and liberalize. And that has not happened. Xi Jinping is a full-scale Mao. Mm. Uh, uh, that's, he, he is into the control. And it was like Trump had to break through and teach people, no, we can criticize these guys because they're wrong. They're taking everybody's liberties. And we'd built so much into their economy that you know, our wallets started to get singed when people did that. And but now more and more people starting to say, you know, this isn't right to do a genocide against the Uyghurs isn't right to do organ harvesting of the fallen gong isn't right to have all these churches torn down and sayings of Mao and Xi Jinping put up in the front and pictures of Xi Jinping in place of Jesus. That's just not very good. <laughs> uh, and you, know, you wouldn't think that had to be said, but. <laughs> No, but it's like we almost had to reteach ourselves that, no, wait, these guys are wrong. What they are doing is wrong, and we need to confront them with it. Uh, and that's, what's, that's what started to take place. Now, I've been banned from traveling to China, even though I have a daughter that we adopted from China who I'm very proud of. Uh, and, but I go, fine. You know what? Uh, if that's the way you guys want to play, uh, I'm, that's, that's fine. You, they need to suffer the criticism that they've deserved and earned by virtue of the things that they've been doing against their own people and what they're doing around the world and the system they're trying to sell to the rest of the world and using high technology to do it. You know, and the final point on this to me is that one of the guys that's leading the Tibetan uh, people, he said, either the world will change China or China will change the world. That's the stark position that we're honestly as a world in today. And we've got to stand up and say no to the Chinese Communist Party that's 100 years old today. You're not taking this any further. Yeah, boy. I mean, if that's, if, if that's the stark assessment and we look at kind of where we're at, that's not encouraging. And that's what makes your event so much more important because, I mean, by all indications, China's changing the world. and. Uh, and uh, that's not a good thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for your consistent voice on this. And I, you know, as I said, my uh, church is uh, um, uh, a missionary outreach of Nigeria, the Anglican uh, Church, uh, Nigerian Anglican Church Missionary Diocese. Um, and of course, Nigeria is one of those nations too that's getting worse and worse each year on the world watch list. And, and you know, they, uh, one of the groups we've worked with, uh, Ambassador, is ICON, the International Council on Nigeria. They do great work, Stephen Anata, and they have a calendar that just documents day in and day out the number of Christians that are, uh, in particular, that are um, persecuted, uh, raped, uh, robbed, uh, convicted of some crime. And, you know, you look at it and it's 20 today and it's 34 tomorrow, and then you start adding it up over the last year and a half, which is how far the calendar goes back. And the scale is just stunning. And as I look on your website here, irfsummit.com, and the organizations that you have been able to assemble and what those organizations represent, it has that same sort of overwhelming effect for me. Because I know, for example, what Barnabas Aid is doing. 
I know what um, the ADF International is is doing uh, on behalf of uh, a whole different different set of issues, and primarily, you know, in, in more Western parts of the world. Although, the, you know, what they've done in India is absolutely heroic. Uh, I know the Billy Graham Association. You know, we all got a front seat you know, to Bob Fu and China Aid and his work. And I know what our, I mean, you start adding up just the work of all of these organizations and the people groups that they represent. And you think, how can we be silent? How can we be silent? And that's why I want to encourage everyone to come to this, to this International Religious Freedom Summit, because this isn't an issue that's just a political issue. It's not an issue that can just be moved forward uh, by political forces. Uh, we need a multitude of voices. So this is not just for political elites. Uh, please consider coming. You'll, ha- you'll leave with an incredible overview of just how significant the issue is, uh, how critical it is that we're all uh, involved and our voices are loud in defense of those right now who face religious persecution my guest today, Ambassador Sam Brambach, who is going to be hosting the International Religious Freedom Summit 2021 in Washington, D.C. And again, the dates are July 13th to the 15th, 2021 in D.C. Ambassador, I'm so grateful for your work. I'm so grateful for your witness, uh, your advocacy for all of these people groups. Uh, and I'm a big fan and grateful for your encouragement of the Colson Center as well. Thanks for joining us today. Happy to do it. And we appreciate all the prayers of your listeners as well, or they... They can't make it in person, they can tune in online. Thanks, John.